Your life is your greatest work of art, and it all relates back to the synchronicity. Welcome to Integrate Yourself, everybody. I'm your host, Allison Pillow, and you can find me at finallythrivingbook.com. Today, I'm here with a very special guest, Susan Wilson. She is a cross-cultural midwife, and she has always seen the body as intelligent and capable and has spent her career helping to support and empower women to trust their bodies and work with the plan nature intended. Her original degree was in psychology and English at Emory University, which she understood uh, once she understood how much of our trajectory is influenced in the womb and at birth, she began her study of midwifery and returned to Emory for a nursing degree and for a master's degree at Yale University. She has had a lifelong interest in other cultures and what birth traditions tell us about them. She has worked among the Navajo in Africa with Alaskan natives and Pacific Rim cultures. She is she is always looking across a, a broad spectrum for what connects us as human beings, as well as the difference in each culture that adds spice to the basic recipe. Her last two decades have been spent working with women during the menopausal transition. She's listen, she listens to women's stories, has, has listened to them, and challenges um, led her to want to describe the continuum of our biological lives as a framework that is both, both purposeful and positive. She has generated a reframing of menopause as it fits within this continuum, building on what came before and showing how our earliest experiences shape our menopause, not just our genetics or physical health. Susan lectures domestically and internationally on women's health at Midwife Breast Health, Reframing Breast Cancer, Hormone Balance, and Recognizing Signs of Sex Trafficking in One's Clinical Practice. She has taught at the Omega Institute for Health Studies and is a frequent lecturer at the annual meetings of the American College of Nurse Midwives. She conducts workshops on the emotional work of menopause. Susan, thanks so much for coming on. This is going to be amazing. And I wanted to do you justice with your, your intro because you have such a, an amazing background <laughs> and uh, very diverse too. And so that's one thing we're going to talk about today. You and I talked before the show started about how menopause is really misunderstood and people, women generally think of menopause as physical symptoms, but it goes beyond that. And it's, it's a rite of passage and actually really exciting, exciting. So um, I'm excited. We're going to be talking about that today too. Yeah. One of my favorite subjects. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm in that phase myself. And, you know, I, I just, I, it was, it was surprising to me. I didn't think I would have the response I did in the, it, at first of this little bit of grief came in about, oh my God, I've had kids. I've had two kids. I'm done with having kids. You know, it's not that I want to have more kids, but it was just kind of like, wow, okay, that's, completely done with, you know, I'm done with that part of my life because you spend most of your life, really, if you do have kids or wanting to have kids, it's that, that huge phase of life. And then we come into menopause and then we have a new phase, a new transition. So um, I would love for you to just share what you've learned along the way, what you've learned from other women as well, and, and how, and really how that got you to where you are now and, and doing what you're doing. Sure. Um, I'll start with what you just brought up, which is grief. And I would say, maybe you agree or maybe you don't, that our culture in no way teaches us how to grieve or allow space for grief, whether it's through a death in the family or whatever. It's something that we're usually asked to do privately. And most of us don't really have the resources to do it. And um I noticed that in my practice that most women as they were walking through this transition were looking back over their shoulder at what they'd lost and that was the major focus and that's what made me want to start um, looking at how um, how this process happens what the uh, initiation of menopause really is and how women could be supported to do it in such a way that it's not all loss. And 
It's a little difficult to do in our culture because we're so focused on youth. We really, um, I think of it as deifying 15 year olds. When you look at the models for beauty and the things that are held up to us as to what it is um, to live a good life, it's always youth. And often these days, the models are more like 15, 16 years old being made up to look older. So that's one thing that women going through menopause are really having to, you know, deal with is this cultural focus on youth. Another thing is that we really, we're really the, mine is the first generation to really start talking openly about menopause and share experiences. Um, up to this point, just like I found the same thing with birth, um, when women would talk about their experiences, often they're telling their horror stories because they had a trauma themselves that still is unresolved. And so when they would share stories about their labor, it was always how horrible things were, how the baby almost died. And, you know, our movies and films and TV programs in this country really focus strongly on that too. Birth is always an emergency. There's always something just barely avoided. And the same thing has come through about menopause because we haven't had an opportunity to really speak openly about this, to tell our stories. Um, often what we have heard from other women is either the horror stories or it's still shrouded in mystery as to what's going on. And most women are kind of in this spin cycle before they even like wake up to notice what's happening or start thinking about it. And yeah. so they find themselves in the midst of this vortex, don't know what's happening, don't know um, how to deal with it. And uh, that's, you know, why I wanted to reframe this and put menopause back into the biological continuum of our lives, because it isn't something that just drops out of the sky and happens to us. It's a natural part of the unfolding of our biological program. It's been planned for. The steps that come before it have prepared us for this. And I just really like to remind women, you've got this, nature's got this, and you yeah. know, it doesn't need to be a horror. So yeah, it's it's totally natural, and it's it's funny as you were speaking. This image popped up in my mind about a, a me. It's a meme that I saw yesterday, and it had a person it had a a, a cartoon figure saying, uh, "It's like which person are you?" And it had two frames. The top one had the person saying, "No one gives a shit," and they were like, ah, oh, like that in the chair, just kind of with their head down and sulking. And the, the bottom frame was like the person celebrating, like, no one gives a shit. Oh my God, <laughs> what a great realization. <laughs> yeah. And so that reminds me of menopause because it's like, you're like, oh, I don't have a purpose, but you're like, oh my God, I don't have a purpose. What could I create now? You know, it's just like now the the sky's the limit, you know? And so that's kind of, that was the feeling I got when I started going through that is now is the time for me to really come into my own and create, you know, start all these creative projects that I really have been wanting to do. And um, so, yeah, that's, a, I think that's a gift. Yeah, it's a great time of possibility. And we're going to be best able to use that if we really know who we are standing where we are right now as we enter it and what it is we would like to do with this, because it's interesting. I mean, nature's so smart. I really have always been in awe of our bodies and the way that they work, but um, hormones literally change us into different beings at different parts of our life. It's very clear that, you know, a latent girl is not the same as a, a woman that's fertile. A pregnant woman is not the same as one who's not pregnant. Um, women after menopause are not the same creatures that we were beforehand. And while it might seem uh, kind of a trite example, I love it because um, 
the caterpillar and the butterfly literally have the same DNA. Nothing's different. The only thing that's different is they've gone through that process in the chrysalis where they've gotten melted down into mush and they've emerged as the next phase of their life. And this is what happens to us at each phase. I mean, most of us don't have the real analytic uh, capacity or the perspective when we're going through puberty to really step back and look at it and understand what's going on. You know, we're just in the spin yeah. cycle. We're trying to survive, trying to get through it. But sure enough, after we have, you know, we generally find our footing and move forward into the next phase of our life and learn how that phase works and, you know, what to do to make it useful and productive. And this same thing is happening now. We do hopefully have a little more perspective, but yeah. um, you that's interesting. Sure. Yeah. yeah, you can be sure that once you've gone through it, you will find your footing and you know find your new place, find the the solid ground to stand on to move forward into the next phase. Because we're literally made to do that. There's a plan in place, and I just feel like the more we can allow ourselves to just give in to that and move with it, the better we'll be. It, it's a continuum. So um, one of the main thrusts of a book that I've recently written really has to do with catching up to present time in menopause or just before menopause. It doesn't have to happen right then, but ways to understand who we are and how we became the women we are now, how our identity as a woman formed, whose voices went into that, who was it that told you you were this or that, and is it in fact even true, because, you know, wherever you go, there you are, and it's never more true than when we're talking about menopause, and our earliest experiences really do shape that, so, um, you know, I wrote a book that went through the whole continuum of a woman's life from how we first become female in the womb to you know the different phases that our hormones put us through and at each juncture you know i've put in a lot of questions for people to ask themselves about their lives and begin to discern you know who am i really what's my authentic voice and how much of that has come to me or been put on me through the culture um, you know, religion, parents, teachers, whatever, because if we know who we are now, then we're going to be much more clear about what we want to do with the gifts that menopause brings. And our hormones literally change us. The hormones that are um, running the menstrual cycle, for instance, they make us want to nurture everything in sight, make babies, scan men for their genetic potential when they walk into a room, even if we're in a happy relationship. It's just that biological urge to reproduce and nourish. The downside of which is that it also helps us to become the doormats for our family, in a sense, and put ourselves aside to do all of that nurturing. I kind of think of it as a hormonal trance that we emerge from in menopause because as that hormone kind of falls, the estradiol, the estriol rises, a different form of estrogen, and that's stimulating the creative parts of our brain, literally, that make us wanna you know, dance that dance, paint that painting, write that book, start that business, do whatever it is that we've really come here to do. And I think that if we can, you know, really begin to filter through and figure out what that is, then we have that big creative boost as well. And we can move into this very rich time of life and give our gift to the world. So yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. That's such a, wow. And it it's the way you frame it makes it sound so exciting and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, and I'm I'm sorry I I didn't mention I don't think I mentioned in the beginning that um, Susan is the author of Making Sense of Menopause Harnessing the Power and Potency of Your Wisdom Years and um, which uh, you know I think is a, a valuable valuable resource for women as they go through this process and uh, it sounds like really it, it's very important to uh, 
I love how you say in your book, you, you, you give people opportunities or women opportunities to reflect on their lives because that's so important to provide that space because many of us have been so busy this whole time, not even having the space to reflect on our lives. Right. So now's the opportunity to do that. And so when you do that, you can find out really what your own truth is. And then from there, uh, define more what you want, because a lot of women that I've worked with don't even know that they, they don't know even what they desire. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really an issue because they put themselves uh, in the, on the back burner and everybody else in front. Do you see mm -hmm. that happening too? Or have you seen that Absolutely. as well? Yeah. It's almost like we're programmed to do that both by our hormones at a certain point in life, by our culture, um, all of that. And uh, so taking that time can be really important and really critical. And I feel like it's important if possible not to wait until you're in the thick of it to begin doing this. Um, it can be very, very useful for women in their 30s and early 40s before they've ever experienced any symptoms of menopause to begin to prepare for this time of life because there is definitely the physical piece and there are many, many things you can do to make that an easier transition. Um, and then there's also this kind of emotional, spiritual transformative piece that happens as well. And the more we're prepared for that, the easier you know we can skate through and we can also begin to look forward to it, which I think is very important the mindset that we take into it absolutely we don't want to just feel like we're not valuable to society anymore once we hit menopause oh, right so valuable <laughs> I, I think we need the voices of mature women more than ever in this world today absolutely really, we've seen, i love men but we've seen where we where the old white man has gotten us to and it's not a pretty place so i think you know women after menopause really do start to not care as much what people think, you know, they will say yeah. their truth and they will do what needs to be done. And um, the cultures that value this time of life, it's really the women, the matriarchs, the elders that are the container for those cultures. And they don't experience what we do as women um, in Western culture when they come to the menopausal years because elderhood is revered in their cultures and not seen as a diminishment. Yeah, I, I was talking to actually Amy the other day uh, or yesterday, <laughs> Amy Fournier, and um, she had brought up that that point that really women, our roles have changed in this modern culture. Whereas before we were revered as, um, you know, we were harmonized, more harmonizing with men. We balanced each other out. So we provided more insight on uh, intuitive skills for them. They depended on us for that. And then, you know, so it was much more than just childbearing, which is mm -hmm. kind of what in, in sex, which is kind of what I feel like is, is is the expectation of our of our society right but there's so much more like you say in other cultures i would I would i would love for you to expand on that and what you found because i don't think a lot of people know that there's anything different not, not, many people don't travel so it's they stay in their like you know circle and so um yeah what have you what have you found um on your discoveries um it's interesting. It, anthropologists in the last you know, decade or so have really been sharing with us that it was once women lived to the age where they became grandmothers that the human species really started to evolve because a woman in, you know, uh, back in the way back that didn't have all of the protective things around that we do. When she had a child, she could only give that child her full attention for a year and a half, two years. Then generally she was pregnant again. So the toddler, you know, was not getting the main resource of her physical um, being of her, you know, attention and that sort of thing. They were kind of on their own. So 
when women started living long enough to be grandmothers, they gathered more food. They were able to care for these younger children and help them to live longer. And they also held the stories of their people, right? So they had the longer view and they were able to begin to tell those stories and to begin to connect the dots for people so that they felt more like they were a unit and a tribe and hung together and helped each other more and that sort of thing. So they call that the grandmother hypothesis. And it's also seen in the other mammalian species on earth that you know gives live birth to its young, has midwives, uh, the whale population. Um, and often when it's the grandmother whales, when food is scarce or something like that, that has the memory of where the good hunting grounds are and takes her pod there to keep everyone safe. So in many um, tribal cultures, the elder women, because they held the stories, because they were not still in the you know, hormonal dance in the same way, were the ones that would decide who, who marries who, who's best suited for that. When does the tribe go to war? Um, what, you know, they balance the priorities and that was respected within the tribe. It still is in many cultures. And uh, these elder women then have status that in our country, you know, it's not seen that way. And I really see menopause as, as a fork in the road, a time at which women will either choose to move forward, thriving, embracing their life and beginning to take on this new phase, or they will begin to diminish and fade away. And I see that a lot. And so much of that has to do with mindset and what you believe the possibilities are for this time of life. Absolutely. I believe that as well. Um, and so we may have touched upon this already, Susan, but how, how, how what do you suggest women do even if it's as early as 30 to transition and prepare for, for menopause, um, I would guess emotional, uh, intelligence as well as, uh, spiritual, um, uh, curiosity, you know, look, looking outside the box with that as well. Um, what would your, what would your opinion well, there, be? There's so it happens on many levels. I would say physically on the physical level to prepare for menopause, it's important to do one of the things that's hardest for us to do actually. And that is manage stress because, yeah. um, in, in the body, the adrenal glands are what manage our stress and they're still in the place that they were back when you run into a mastodon on the plane, you have this tidal wave of hormones that moves through your body so that you can run faster, fight harder, climb a higher tree, survive that encounter. That's the way we're made. And then after the threat is gone, everything is supposed to come back down to a normal steady state. But in our culture, because the brain doesn't know the difference between running into a mastodon on the plane or sitting in traffic, having financial stress, you know, having five plates spinning at one time, having work things to deal with, kid things to deal with, fight with your spouse, illness, to the body, that's all stress. It sees it the same way. So it mounts that fight or flight, but then it keeps getting triggered over and over and over through the day and because it lasts two to three hours, that whole process, once it's triggered, we're in kind of a constant state of stew, or stew and chew or you know, low level fight or flight. And that's often why women wake up in the middle of the night, actually. They have a drop in their blood sugar and the body mounts fight or flight to raise their blood sugar levels because the brain is dependent on that being very steady state. I think um, it's also, especially given the way that we're culturally groomed to be a certain way these days, it's important to make the point that there's good stress and bad stress, but it's all stress to the body. You can have a woman who loves her life, who gets up at 5.30 in the morning to hit the gym so that she gets her physical exercise in and 
goes to her job fueled on her morning latte and, you know, has a busy day doing something she loves out to dinner with friends and home and in bed by 1130 or something. But she still is not getting enough sleep. She's in fight or flight all day. She's running on caffeine. Um, you know, the body doesn't take the emotional hit it does if you have a woman, say, who's having to hold down three jobs or has an abusive partner or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the body stress is very similar. And so nature's made it so that when the ovaries begin to wind down at menopause and don't make as much of the estradiol that's run our menstrual cycle, it becomes the job of the adrenal glands and the fat cells to make our hormones for the next part of life. And if we arrive at that time of life with our adrenals exhausted from all the stress that we've been under constantly, there's nothing there to catch that ball. And that's yeah. when things start to spiral downward. I've had so many women say to me, well, yeah, you know, I have stress in my life, but nothing more than usual. I've been dealing with it. And all of a sudden I miss a couple of periods and I'm having hot flashes and night sweats and can't sleep and I'm gaining weight and I have no libido and my hair is falling out. How can just missing a couple of periods yeah. make all that happen? And of course the answer is, well, it's not just missing a couple of periods. The whole thing that's supposed to be there to catch the ball is not functioning. It's not present. So um, whatever we can do early on to pace ourselves, to allow time for things to just settle and become quiet, to make sure that we get enough sleep, to make sure yeah. that we nourish the other parts of ourselves so that we're not deep in adrenal fatigue by the time we hit perimenopause, that's going to make a huge difference. Um, but it's very hard to do. So many of us are caught in situations where we feel like, you know, I wish I didn't have to work this much, but I have to, you know, my family depends on me. There's the financial piece, you know, all of that. Um, and in those cases, I think it's always helpful at any time of life to kind of make a very simple thing, make a good for me, bad for me list. Okay. Yeah. What, what do I spend my time doing every day? Just put it down there, whether, whether it's picking up your teenager socks or, you know, doing the dishes or all the things that mothers and women take on for the people in their family, what nourishes me, you know, on the other yeah. side, what is it that nourishes me, helps me to feel more full, more relaxed. And then, you know, go through your list, be, you know, be really honest with yourself and go, okay, maybe can my teenager pick up his own socks? Check, you know, yeah. delegate whatever you can delegate, let go of whatever's no longer nurturing you or positive in your life and add more of what brings you pleasure. You know, women have really been raised to think that having pleasure is a selfish act somehow, but, <laughs> you know, we're supposed to be living in joy and pleasure has so many wonderful effects in the body on the brain, on the nervous system, on your body and on your hormones and the way everything works. So, you I, know, I would think it would help you man deal with stress too, right? It would be a little absolutely. bit more resilient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one of like the first little exercises that I suggest that people do. And of course there's going to be that category in the middle where, you know, maybe you're taking care of an aging parent and you're the only one or something, or you have yeah a family member in your life that is just very difficult to deal with. And yet you, you can't just walk away from that. You need to stay in the room. So you can figure out ways to create boundaries in those situations, get yourself a little help if you can, when you need it. But it's so important as women to be on our own list, so to speak, and yeah. also you know, to make sure that we're keeping that balance because we really don't want to arrive completely exhausted at the next stage for ourselves. Absolutely. Yes. I, I agree with everything you said. It's, and I teach a, a very similar approach too. I used to do a lot more nutrition coaching. And what I would tell women is that 
you you can you can't give more than you have. So if you don't have enough reserves, you you know it's going to drain you. You're going to get hit fatigue after the adrenaline wears off, and that is also um, why I used to tell people, or I still do. You know, if you're feeling like you can't sleep at night, then start eating small meals to just nourish yourself uh, throughout the day so your body starts to regulate blood sugar so that you can relax when the night hits, right? So, and, and then, yeah, so it, you said so much within that. I was just like, ah, yes, yes. Sorry, and, and it's the joy. Again. Yeah, the joy aspect that we forget. I've, I've been teaching also people how to how to bring more joy into their lives because I don't think a lot of people know how. And they don't... Yeah. Un- no, right? It, they, they, it has. It's not role modeled. What's role modeled is the the striving and hustling uh, archetype or whatever that is. You know, it's just like keep going. You can do it all. And I just think there's something so wrong with that. You know, yes, we can do it all, but do we want to do it all? What do you really want to do, right? Yeah. For instance, I think if someone has a goal of making money before you ever start, it's important to say to yourself, how much is enough? Because otherwise you're just chasing after, yeah. it. you know, it's always need more, need more. And the same thing is true in our lives and simple things like good for me, bad for me list, creating a rhythm in your life saves so much energy because if your body knows when you're likely to be more active, when you're likely to eat during the day, when you're you know, going to sleep, it can have the appropriate amount of energy available for you to do that when it kind of is expecting it. If we're random all over the place, you know, the body has to have high energy online all the time in case we need it and it uses it up. So it's kind of like a bank account. You want yeah. to can serve so that you have it when you need it. But if you're spending needlessly all the time, it's not going to be there when you really need it. So just very simple things. And I also suggest people just move toward the open space, start with one thing you feel like you can do, that it has a huge ripple effect. You know, if we try to do everything at once and, you know, change our lives all at once, it's much often harder to do it that way. So you know, there are lots of things that um, we talk about in that regard, and also things that, you know, can be helpful in terms of nutritional supplements or bioidentical hormones, if you want them, or, you know, and we, as I said, we all are who we are when we arrive here. So for one woman who might have been dealing with a lot of this earlier, all they need is a little lifestyle change. For another person, it's just a little tweak of hormones. For someone whose adrenals are exhausted, they're gonna have to make some bigger lifestyle changes. For someone with unresolved trauma in their past, they may need to have some time with a therapist to begin to work through that before the way opens and you can really step into it. But it's wonderful work to do. It's very, um, you know, it feels good to do it too, to really finally spend some time on ourselves and some thought, you know, about looking back at our life and begin to pull out the learning and the wisdom and what it's all been about to finally have the perspective to do that. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it comes down to learning just the act of prioritizing yourself. If only 10 minutes a day, whatever Mm -hmm. you can start with. And then, uh, like you said, um, you know, I wrote a book as well. And this, I I actually, it's so funny because I remember now when I was listening to you on Amy's show, I was like, oh my God, that's this, that's what I talk about too. And it was just like, wow, there's so many similarities there. And uh, talk about being selective with your calendar, get your calendar out. What do, don't you need on it? What, you know, what is essential? What, what brings you joy? Mm-hmm. Come back to your natural rhythm. You know, what, what, when is the best time for you? If you're going to work out, when's the best time? How many, how many times a week or when, you know, schedule your, you know, make sure you schedule your meals and when's the best time for that? And when does it feel good? You know, and so again, it's for women, I think we forget that we are very uh, sensual beings and we really 
it is important for us to feel into a lot of this stuff because that's something that we do have that is um, more of a feminine aspect. And if we ignore that, I feel like that's when you get into health pr uh, problems um, yeah, and issues and I, emotionally. Yeah. I think it's all programmed. And we come in as souls, if you will, with things that we bring with us. And I think if we're moving toward what really draws us, where our curiosity takes us or where our interest takes us, or if somebody's more a feeling person where you just feel that, that draw, that if we pay attention to that and move along those lines, that we're going to feel more fulfilled, we'll feel more joy and we're more likely to do what we came to do, give our gift to the world, however you want to put it. Yeah, absolutely. And that is that is so satisfying to be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's the ultimate act of service, in my opinion, is just to, mm -hmm. you know, honor yourself, right? Yeah. Um, which really spills out to inspiring others to do the same for themselves. And then you can give more because you're giving yourself you know, and you're all giving to yourself and you're receiving. So then you know what, what a gift it is to give, you know, and you have the reserves to do that. Yeah, um, like you say, if we're totally depleted, we, we can't help others. So right. even if you're wanting, if you're a really giving person, you can give yourself to you run dry and then have nothing, or you can fill your own cup and allow that to spill over to those around you. Yeah. Yeah, which is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful way to contribute uh, because giving goes, it, it, you know, what I discovered, uh, especially this past year is giving extends, like I can't give, you know, so much of myself if I haven't given to myself first. So like, for example, if I did want to do a, do a big project, like I, I wrote a book and I, I could not have done that. I could not have put myself even out there like that if I hadn't done uh, the work on myself where I was able to receive, uh, first and nourish myself. Um, mm -hmm. I would not have been able to give something that big to other people, you know, and, but I, I don't think we think about it like that. I think we just think about like, give, 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 and, you know, it's like that martyr kind of role or, or we must suffer, you know, to be of service. And, and it's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> especially women in my generation I grew up in the 50s and 60s and definitely that we were there to serve <laughs> you yeah. know it was not um, okay for a woman to have a voice a girl to have a voice and to take up space and to have that curiosity or the drive to really move out into the world you had to fight for that yeah. so you know and I think it's really important that we tell our stories, you know, so that, you know, because women, one thing I found is women really feel isolated in menopause because there's not um, a lot of information coming into it. A lot of people, as I said, are having symptoms that really concern them before they ever start to wake up to what's going on in the medical culture doesn't help. I mean, you can have a woman, I hear this all the time, going in to see their doctor and talking about these symptoms and doctors will listen and, you know, run a million expensive tests and figure it out and then just come back to them and go, well, we can't find anything. <laughs> and, you know, things that are normal during perimenopause and menopause, symptoms that you might have would not be normal at another time in life. And so, we tend to pathologize them. We tend to really not what know what's going on. And I think it's so important to let women know, to help educate other women about how our bodies work and yeah. what you can expect, what's normal, what's not normal. And then also when we share our stories and have them witnessed, there's a lot of healing in that. And we also don't feel isolated and alone in the experience. So it's really my hope that with the book that I've written, that women will do this work together, that they'll get together with a small group of, you know, we get together for book groups that might not be who you want to do it with, but grab a couple of other women that you trust and that are girlfriends that you feel like you can share with and do it together and tell yeah. your stories to each other. 
um, because that does so much to help you. Often there are stories we tell ourselves over and over and over again yeah. about why we are the way we are, the way this happened back then. So this is why I did this. And then when we actually tell the story and to someone else and hear the words leave our mouth, we know, oh, that's, that's really not so yeah. accurate. Or I right. can see it in a different way now than I could then. I'm not right in it. I have some perspective. So yeah. Yeah. And then you're not attached to the story anymore. It helps for that. Yeah. I think the the book club is a great idea. That's really wonderful. Um, yeah. What a, what, yeah, there's just not enough about menopause out there, but I, I love that you're, you're sharing your experiences on, on deeper levels than just physical, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it also is, is emotional and spiritual, um, you know, cause it, it, like I said, in the very beginning, it's a rite of passage and it's mm -hmm. an exciting rite of passage because now like, there's nothing that you really, you don't have to care so much what people think you, it, 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 there's nothing you have to really do. You can, you can start focusing on your own wants and desires and be of service in that way too. So, um, I was gonna, I was gonna ask like, uh, let me, can I say yeah. one more thing before yeah, yeah, we move sure. on to the next yeah, thing? Yeah. I think also it's important to understand what's coming so we can share that with our partners, you know, right. are, you know, regardless of what sex our partners are, but certainly with men and women, often marriages start to founder around menopause because women are going through something the men don't understand, or all of a sudden, you know, our anger's rising up because there's nothing there to be covering it over anymore. Estradiol has left the building. And <laughs> so, you know, our hormone balance is different. And a lot of um, partnerships founder at that time because people yeah. don't understand what's going on. So it can be, and sexuality changes somewhat, you know, it, it can often get, and I hear this a lot, really, really better. And yeah. so- I've heard um, that too, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, it's not all a downward slope, but all of it requires communication, requires time, presence. You really need to um, to be aware of what's happening, stay in the room and work with it. And like any transition while you're in it, then you have the fruits of it as it, you know, fades yeah. away. So it's kind of, it really is getting back to a natural rhythm, uh, a, a natural feminine rhythm because it's, it's a slower rhythm and it's cyclical, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Which is different than what we are doing if we're in a job or if we're busy all the time, taking care of a lot of different things. So mm -hmm. yeah, great time for reflection. I love that. And the, yes, I agree. The book club, I want to say something else about that is yeah. I really think that um, it's, it's so important, like you said, to, for, to create these women's circles so we can just be able to, uh, you know, have some trust and support and even praise within these situations, you yes. know? Yeah. We'll it's it up. very important. Very important. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, I've realized this recently talking to people and I, I really, I saw it in myself too, on a, even another level is that we don't understand, we don't realize that we have so much support, but we think we have to do it all ourselves. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> until we open ourselves up, slow down enough to receiving that support and that love in our lives, um, we're, it's, it will just continue to pass us by if we don't take a deep breath and allow it to happen, you know, mm -hmm. allow other people to come into our lives that will help and support you. Um, I think so. So we kind of, what I feel like we, we also covered was our earlier experiences, not just nutrition, not just lifestyle, but even like <clears throat> emotional wellness. So, you know, resolving trauma because it will resurface uh, probably when you hit menopause, menopause and slow down a little bit. Right. Um, what, yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing that would be an important thing you can do. I mean, you can do that as early as your twenties and, you know, but, 
Uh, but I think that is very important also to start to just pay attention to the stories. You know, have they been, like you said, been passed down to you from generation to generation? Are you still believing that about yourself? Or are you ready to create some new beliefs there for yourself mm -hmm. too? Yeah, like who would we be without our stories? You know, the question, oh, who might I be if I didn't keep seeing myself in that same way all the time? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Make new stories. What's that? Make new stories. Yes, it's a good Create opportunity. Make room for new stories to emerge. I think it's it's scary for some people to let go of those stories because they they're so oh, attached okay. to it with their identity, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, some women like to do um, a menopause ritual, for instance, where, and you can do it. I've had people do it in many different ways that have chosen to do that. Um, I myself, because I had uh, moved to a new place had a baby relatively late in life and then finished nursing her and essentially went into menopause soon after that. And um, the people in the new place I'd moved to did not really know my history. They just knew me as kind of the midwife, the earth mother, my daughter's mother. But I had a history of doing theater and being a dancer and doing all kinds of different things early in my life. So I went out and got, went through and got pictures of, you know, this is where I grew up. These are my parents. This is my family. This was my first boyfriend kind of made, went through myself. And I think looking at pictures can be a very um, good way of evoking memories. You know, if you look yeah. at yourself at a certain age and try to like put yourself back in that body posture or, you know, really feel into what those pictures are showing you, it brings up a lot of memories and a lot of what that time of life was about. So I kind of caught them up on all the stages of my life leading to that. And then in a sense, made vows to the next arc of my life. This is what I want to give my energy to going forward. And then, you know, of course you have a lot of good food, you put on the music, you dance, you do whatever you do. But um, I went to one once that a woman had um, her community create this beautiful robe. You know, she had made a basic robe and people decorated it and beaded it and um, created this lovely thing for her, you know, for rituals. And she would hang it because this woman was a drummer and a ritual doer. Oh, and nice. So she, you know, would hang it on the wall as, the way you do kimonos or something and then take it down and use it for rituals. Or, you know, there are a million different ways you can do it, whatever kind of expresses you most authentically. But to create something, even if it's just you in the bathtub alone, you know, with a candle, <laughs> Um, a time when you consciously say, I'm stepping through this doorway and this is what I want to take with me. You know, it's important yeah. to let go of the things that don't serve us anymore, the people that don't resonate anymore. Um, we're no longer needing to drag a lot of things along <laughs> with <laughs> us that no longer serve who we are. So important time. And with that, I, I I would think that first of all, that's beautiful. And thank you. Yeah, because you're you're you you can you have the opportunity to step into and embody what you'd really like to embody finally, right? So I would think one of the gifts from that would be um even stronger intuition as you step into menopause, right? Yeah, I think so. And yeah. a lot of what you do describe that. Yeah. Have you experienced that as well? Um Actually, for me, it kind of went the other way and it wasn't really due to menopause. It was due to other things, but okay. it was more intuitive growing up. And when I was a younger woman and then later in my life, um, it shifted a bit, but that wasn't to do with menopause at all. Okay. Yeah. Just life circumstances or, yeah. Well, uh, Susan, uh, if you would, I would love it if you would leave my audience with uh, some final thoughts about all of this. This has been amazing. Uh, I love, I want to, I will be reading your book. I have not had a chance to yet, but I, I will be. 
definitely it. reading it. And uh, cause it's just, again, such a valuable resource. And as I go through uh, many of these things personally as well, I mean, I know a lot about health and wellness and spirituality and emotional stuff, but I still need a resource because like, it's, it, you know, there's some, sometimes you're like, what's going on right now? Is this, uh, you know, is this menopause or something else? So yeah, um, one of the nice things about having a resource you can pick up in your hands too, is you're going to be drawn to different parts of it at different times and different questions will call out to you or different times of your life. And it it's full of little exercises you can do if you want to, if you work that way or you know, many suggestions about, well, how do you get to that piece of information that you're trying to retrieve that's difficult? But one or two of the important things I'd really say um, are to remember how you experience your menopause is really in your hands. It's not something that happens to you. I mean, certainly it's culturally driven, but if you go into it being aware of that, you can change that story for sure. And I think um, knowing yourself, as we've talked about, is really critical to moving into the next stage. Be proactive. Don't wait till you're in the thick of symptoms to start thinking about all of this. You know, begin to prepare ahead of time, deal with stress levels, start to think about what nourishes you. Um, all of that sort of things. And, you know, just don't buy the message that your life is over and excuse me in any way, because it's, it's only going to get better and tell your stories. So I love that. I love that. It's, it's all about nourishment. I, th I don't think that's, you know, a big, a big thing to prepare for either. I think we can do that in, in small phases and, and certainly with your book as well. So thank you so much, Susan, for everything that you have talked about today and everything, all the wisdom that you've shared. Thanks so much for coming on. Sure. It's been a pleasure. Really. Yeah. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> I know, right? It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I love, I love talking about this stuff too. Um, please, I have your website right here, but um, is there another place that you want to send people to find your stuff? You have, well, it's making sense of menopause.com is the website, right? Right. And, and on that, you know, I blog as well. So I throw all the blogs up there, the um, podcasts and articles and things like that are on there too. If people just want to take a basic scan at some of the things I'm talking about, I send a newsletter out, um, I'm slowly <laughs> embracing <laughs> social media, kicking and screaming, learning that, you know, now I have yeah. to do that in order for people to, to, you know, hear the message. So. Yeah. It's a bit of a catch 22, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. And um, I will leave all of the uh, places to find you in the show notes as well. Thanks for, thanks for being here, Susan. Yeah. Thanks for asking me. Right. You're Enjoy welcome. It. Your life is your greatest work of art, and it all relates back to the synchronicity.